welcome to the Massachusetts School of Law Educational Forum. Thank you for joining us. This program is brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law and is shown nationwide. The topic for today's show is the marriage benefit. I think what makes uh, my marriage uh, particularly happy is that my wife and I share the, the same common goals. Women like security. Uh, the security of having a spouse. Uh, a good husband, for me, realistically, is someone who's there when the times are really rough. I still try to be a good husband. Hu I have to work at it. It's easy for her. What are the benefits of a long-term marriage? This question is answered by Mark O'Connell in his new book, The Marriage Benefit. Mark O'Connell, Ph.D., is a clinical instructor of psychology at the Harvard Medical School and at Cambridge Hospital. He is also the author of the critically acclaimed book, The Good Father. Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks, Thanks for taking the time to come up here. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to both of you. Also joining us for today's show is the co-host, Michael L. Coyne, who is also the associate dean of the Massachusetts School of Law. Mike, welcome. Thanks, Doc. And I'm Diane Sullivan. Thanks for joining us. Mark, tell us a little bit about your book, The Marriage Benefit. Well, I, I wrote this uh, after years of doing couples therapy and uh, accumulatively feeling that the work that I was doing didn't quite capture some of the benefits that I was seeing uh, at times in my office to folks who were married and who were really willing to struggle through things. You know, as a, uh, as a therapist, actually as a, someone who's trained, first of all, as a psychoanalyst and as an individual therapist, you know, I'm always interested in how people change. And one of the things that I began to notice was that there were ways in which when folks were really able and willing to struggle things out with each other in a marriage, I was seeing personal changes and personal gains that I thought were equal to or even beyond what I was seeing in some of the individual therapy that I was doing. And, um, and as I thought about that more, I came to the conclusion that we actually don't ask enough out of our marriages, uh, that they can be more than we ask them to be. You know, it's really odd. We have this... Uh, I think in many ways an outdated view of marriage. You know, the way in this culture that we think about most things from physics to the way baseball is played, it changes over time. But if you think about the way we think about marriage, I think we still have a largely 1950s view of marriage, that it's a kind of safe, civilized place where you compromise some of your uh, excitements and instincts for something that is uh, economically healthy and happy. And uh, it's not a very risky picture of marriage. And I actually think that what we need to do is really come up with a new way of thinking about marriage, one that involves both more gain but also more willingness to endure some kind of risk. I think a lot of women would like to rewrite now some of, you know, the, the roles that they play in a marriage because, again, it's not a 1950s marriage any right. longer today. I think when we got married, we meaning people of my generation, in growing up in the 50s, um, getting married in the 60s, there was no turning back. It really was a commitment, a lifetime commitment. It truly was till death do us part. I don't want to say that currently people feel that, um, oh, well, I'll give it a try, and if it doesn't work out, I'll go on to something else. But I think there is always that safety net, I think they feel in the background, that, well, if it really doesn't work, mm -hmm. I can make it on my own. I'm not sure that women of my generation ever felt that they could make it on their own. I think they really felt that they were an appendage, um, not a whole being. It changed. It definitely changed as, as women my age went back to work and uh, became career, much more career-oriented than we started out being. Um, but I think initially we, we went into this as we left our parents' home and we went to our husband's home. There was no period in between when we were on our own. There was no feeling that we could ever do it on our own. My daughters don't feel that way. They're much more independent. They know they can take care of themselves. They can earn a living themselves. They can be happy by themselves. Um, and I think this is probably in the long run a much healthier way to go into a marriage. As you a couple you feature in the book, Jason and Leslie. Now, Jason is involved with another woman, and of course he blames Leslie for all of the problems in the marriage. Mm -hmm. She's cold, she doesn't provide the romance that he's looking for. You say in the book that he should stop blaming Leslie, and she should stop trying to appease Jason. What I'm going to say to you now is why should they stay married? 
And what I'm going to answer is I don't know that they should. You know, one of the things that is, I'm really glad we're starting right in this place because I think the title of the book admittedly can suggest that uh, I think people should stay married no matter what. And it's just not what I'm saying. I mean, I, frankly, and this may be a, a radical and uh, surprising thing to say given the title of the book, I think as many people stay married who should leave each other as do leave each other who should stay married. It's, it's not about how you should stay married. It's about really the kinds of decisions people make uh, and why they make those decisions along the road to staying married. So for example, when you take Jason and Leslie, the folks in this book, they're incredibly unhappy with each other and they're blaming their unhappiness uh, on each other. But what they're really unwilling to look at in a more honest way are the actual sources of their unhappiness. I mean, they're unhappy about real life things like getting older, about coming to terms with the what reality of what their lives really are. Uh, and they're using each other in a kind of dance that allows them not to take a look at those things. What I really push Jason and Leslie to do, and really all the couples I work with, is to take a look at why they're really feeling what they feel and the way in which they're kind of incorporating each other into not really dealing with their own feelings. The decisions that they make about staying together or not staying together, I think, follow from that discussion. And it's not always that the answer is going to be that they should stay together. So not everyone who comes to consult with you Really, it, it's not only not wise to potentially stay together, but it may be more beneficial to, to, to move apart. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, look, I mean, I, I, we all have our biases, I suppose, in whatever we do. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in the in how lawyers do this when you work with somebody, <laughs> and you know, you badly. You, you know, well, it's, it's, it, I mean, but we all have to struggle with the kind of in life. You know, whenever we do something that's interesting that it involves other people, with kind of wrestling with. Um, knowing what our biases and inclinations are, and then at the same time trying to do a good job even in the face of those. And I, you know, I'll admit that I, I, I begin probably every couples therapy I do with an assumption that, you know, uh, it is probably going to be better if they can work this out than if they don't. But it's, uh, you know, I probably play that a little bit over the 50-50 line, mm -hmm. because what I, what, I really, what I really actually believe is that um, the conversations are about getting to know who you are. And, and, and that from that, decisions about leaving or staying uh, follow. And yeah. yeah. I mean, what's kind of interesting is I think for a lot of people, they fe feel that there's some level of stigma to have to go see a right. marriage counselor. And ha it would seem like their, their interest is in trying to save it, but it right. sometimes the relationship is just simply not salvageable? Uh, I think sometimes it's not. I mean, it's interesting. The things that, um, at least in my experience, turn out to be the kinds that are the most problematic in terms of whether relationships are going to make it or not are, are somewhat different than you would, you, what you'd expect. Um, really, really vicious arguments uh, aren't necessarily um, a terrible sign of an outcome. Mm -hmm. um, the things that, uh, that, nor is an affair, by the way. I mean, I've, I've known a lot of relationships where you know, folks have really struggled through, um, you know, the hardship and the pain that's caused by an affair and actually gotten to a better place. I mean, I think there are times, and I, you know, my wife's jokingly suggested that a book that would sell would be How Your Affair is Good for Your Marriage. At least it would sell <laughs> like this. And I'm, I'm not saying that. But, uh, but, I, but, I, but I do believe that all of these things can ultimately be catalysts for getting to a different place. The things, interestingly, that I've found are real um, deal breakers are, one, when people don't believe that they have anything to work on and they really believe that in a kind of set way, not just in a defensive way, mm -hmm. and you can't get them to a different position, that's a, that's a really hard sign. Uh -huh. And the other is when people don't feel anything for each other anymore, uh, and it's not just a kind of defensive numbness, but, but they really don't care. Um, th those are the two things that really worry me when I first meet somebody. Are there certain crisis points where people decide, well, I need a couples therapy at this point, and that, that that would be more beneficial for them to see you earlier rather than later in, yeah. in their relationship? Well, uh, there's two. I'm going to take that question up on two levels because sure. it's a question that leads into some of the deeper things that I wanted to uh, write about in the book. First of all, uh, just pragmatically, I think people tend to come too late. Mm -hmm. you know, people tend to come when they're in a tremendous amount of pain. Um, uh, and I think it would be better if people came earlier. Uh, but, but part of the reason I think that is because I think, I think we think about what makes or breaks a marriage way too much in terms of the whole business of how uh, much pain there is or how much hardship there is or what the trouble is. See, I mean, one of the things I really wanted to do in writing this was to redefine, again, how we think about marriage. And you know, we tend to have this kind of Rodney King attitude about marriage, like uh, 
why can't we just get along? As if a good marriage is one in which people can get along without a lot of rancor or mm -hmm. hardship. And I think that that way underestimates what a marriage can be. I think ultimately we do better in life when we take on more than when we take on less. And I think we ought to try the same attitude about marriages, that, that we ought to think about them as actually an opportunity to grow and change that really can be quite radical in this particular culture. And if we have time, I'd love to get into why this culture in particular. But what I would argue, and one of the kind of cornerstones about thinking about this is that people ought to stop thinking about problems, I mean, the kinds of repeating problems that actually characterize every intimate relationship over time as, as necessarily only bad things. Because I would argue that every single one of those repeating problems, those repeating arguments that folks get into are frankly opportunities. That, that each of those things represents ways in which people are bringing problematic parts of themselves to a relationship that are theirs to work on, and that were they able to address them and change them, they'd actually grow individually. And what happens if we start thinking about these repeating problems as opportunities, rather than necessarily something that you have to fix and get on from? If a woman finds somebody and wants to spend the rest of her life with that person and wants to go through the good and the bad and wants, I always said that if you want to go home every day and see that person and spend time with that person, then and that and vice versa then that person is for you to marry if you are looking for some other way to spend your time or you want to take a vacation s vacation separately or you want to go out partying every night with your friends then you probably shouldn't marry that person because that person should be the person you want to go home to and see every single night and and when you see that person that you should feel good inside yeah. One of the things you talk a lot about in the book is baby boomers right. and the fact that we baby boomers, Mike, it's hard to believe that we're baby boomers now, what he would say approaching mm -hmm. midlife to later life, yeah. which is really hard to accept. But it in is. any event, <laughs> it's right. only mid if we're going to live to 100 now. <laughs> right. 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 Uh, well, right. I'm, I'm waiting for the cure that we're going to live forever. Right. But in any event, you suggest that society tells people like us right. that if we don't have impeccable health, attractive partners, a great right. sex life, and tremendously talented kids, that somebody or something is to blame. Right. Yeah. How does that in impact marriage? There's a, there's a wonderful um, anecdote in a, in a book by Julian Barnes, The History of the World in Ten and a Half Chapters, mm -hmm. uh, where this guy it dies, and he thinks he's gone to heaven because he ends up in some place where he can have whatever he wants, whenever he wants it. And it takes him three days to realize that he's actually in hell, which is it's a wonderful yeah. parable because <laughs> it's, it's a parable about how if you could have whatever you wanted, whenever you wanted, which in, I think in so many ways is the message that we've grown up with in this culture, both <coughs> directly and also more subtly and insidiously, you know, we'd be ultimately incredibly unhappy because nothing would mean anything. But I think that our generation is, is struggling with this as we get older. You know, I mean, so much of, I think, the art of getting older is this thing that Eric Erickson talked about as generativity, which involves many things, like, for example, seating the stage, center of the stage for the next generation, really coming to terms with your limitations. I mean, really looking at the way in which um, life doesn't offer everything that you had hoped it would. And, you know, you can think about that as a kind of negative, depressive thing that you just have to deal with and accept. But I, I actually think that you can think about it more positively than that. I mean, sure, it's painful, and sure, there's a lot to mourn, but there's also possibility in all of these limitations. I mean, the more that you, you know, the more that you, in a way, collide with the realities of life, there's also a way in which I think you can grow and find a lot of meaning. I mean, it's not only a problem in our generation. I think we see it with kids. I mean, it's mm -hmm. funny. I, I do a lot of talking about kids and sexuality. Uh, and, and one of the things that comes up again and again is the way that, that kids who are growing up in this world of infinite possibility end up really searching for meaning. Because they're trying to find, like, what's going to mean anything if I can just have whatever I want whenever I want it? It's, a, it's an empty making thing. So, you know, bringing it all back now to marriage, I think, I think one of the things that and frankly, I want to be clear, when I'm talking about marriage, I'm not just talking about marriage in the sense of a legal name marriage. I'm talking about a deep personal commitment to work something through with somebody else over time. It is an incredible exercise at its best in learning about limitation, but in a very positive way. I mean, about learning about how whenever you make a choice, you have to give something up as well as get something which is, I think, a, an exercise that we lose track of so much in this culture. I mean, I don't know whether we'll get to talk about this, but, but promiscuity and monogamy <coughs> are, 
are wonderful examples of that. What you, what you get and what you give up when you make a choice to be monogamous. And I'm not talking about in the kind of moralistic sense that I think railroads that argument these days. I'm more talking about in a kind of emotional, psych psychological sense. There's probably a lot of communication, a lot more, as the kids get older, a lot more alone time for us to kind of keeping in touch, not just how was work and what happened with the kids today. More or less, you know, remember why we got married in the first <laughs> place. Be, you know, besides just having children, there was another, there were many other reasons why. So it's, it's more or less kind of reviewing that constantly mm, yeah. so that you remember why you got married and you think, okay, well, I, I, liked, I, li I liked him then, I love him now, let's kind of keep that going. One let's of the things you say is people like Mike and myself mm. should take stock of what should we now finally concede as being unattainable mm -hmm. and then take a look at how do we want to spend the remaining part of our life. So I'm willing to concede that I'm not going to run a sub three hour marathon, not ever, not in this lifetime. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, I don't know what else I'm willing to right. concede, Mike. Well, well I mean, the way you even posited it, though, Di, is I mean that we somehow have to accept that we're limited even because we're middle aged yeah. at this point. I mean, because I, I took something else from the book is that regardless of our age, regardless of where our relationship stands, that what we can do at this point is improve the relationship and in the process improve ourselves to, to really arrive at what, what our full potential is. Mm -hmm. are, we, are we both right or both wrong? Uh, I think you're both right. I, I'm, I'm interested in what you said because I think, uh, I think it's, it's something, uh, it is so hard to talk about limitation, I think, mm -hmm. in, in general oh, sure. and in this culture without it becoming a kind of depressive commentary about what we can't have. And, uh, you know, and I think that there's a larger issue here. If we, if we get caught in the particulars of, okay, what can't I do? Uh, we, we sometimes lose track of a larger issue, which is just the whole matter that every time you make a choice, I mean, let's take the matter of marathon, right? Let's say you could run a sub three hour marathon. Well, you might be able to do that, but you probably can't run a sub three hour marathon and do 15 other things that you'd love to do. You, you have to make a choice about where you want to put your energies. And in that choice, two things happen. One, you give something up, and one, you get something. And I think we're so focused on what you give up in that choice that we lose track of what you get. Mm. And, and, and that's more the nature of limitation that I'm trying to talk about. It's not this depressive, well, we're getting old, we have to forget that we wanted to do all these things, and now we can't do a thing. It's about, it's about really contending with the reality that all of our lives are lived within these limits. And I think one of the things that's happened in marriage, by the way, is you know, I, one of the things that happens, I see a lot of folks come in and talk about Okay, well, there's a problem. That means that things aren't right between us. You know, we've just made the wrong choice because if we really, I'm making a little bit of a caricature of it, right, but if we really were right for each other, we wouldn't be this unhappy. Well, that's, that's just baloney. I mean, that is not the way life works and it's not the way intimate relationship works, but that attitude, I think, is something that we've all been fed. Well, let me, let me ask, let me follow up with respect to the, the issue of the limitations. Yeah. I mean, isn't, isn't at least in part the, the notion or some parts of the book suggest that um, by working on that relationship, the, mm -hmm. the long-term relationship and making some sacrifices for, for uh, along the way, don't we become uh, better people and, and more likely to reach our full potential yeah. by, by engaging in that long-term relationship? Right. Yeah, thanks for asking that. Because I think, you know, there's a funny paradox in this book, mm -hmm. which is that uh, I believe that the act of working on something in a marriage uh, together can make each person individually better. And in a way, it can sound like a kind of what's in it for me argument yep. that sounds like <laughs> the narcissism <laughs> of today's culture. And, uh, uh, but there's a wonderful way in which this paradox, I think, also opens a window to what narcissism really is. You know, narcissism is not about um, just being self-sacrificing. It's not about not thinking about yourself. It's about getting off a kind of illusory stool of grandiosity and self-importance and, and actually having um, a stronger sense of self. Uh, you know, strong senses of self aren't selves that say, I am so wonderful. They're actually senses of self that involve the capacity for a little bit more self-sacrifice. So that oddly and paradoxically, uh, what, what comes from working on a relationship can often be a stronger individual sense of self, but not a narcissistic sense of self. 
So, so how do we work on that relationship? I mean, right now, uh, yeah. my, my youngest daughter just went off to yeah. college. The house is empty. Yeah. Um, we're back where we were 28 years right. ago. It's just the two of us. Right. So what, what, how do we make um, that relationship seem like, or, or is it just unattainable that it was 30 years ago with, with all of life that's passed between us at this point? Yeah. Well, so there are two questions embedded in that one, I think. One is, uh, one is a little easier to answer than the other. The one that's a little easier answer is the one that has to do with wanting or thinking about going back 28 years, right? mm -hmm. which is, you know, if you look at the, the, the bookstores and the shelves of marriage books, I mean, it seems like 50% of them are about bring back the passion of your early years, which I, I have to say I think is one of the greatest pieces of self-help snake oil. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's, it's, uh, it's, again, preying on this idea in the culture that everything should be the way it was when it was mm -hmm. fantastic. You know, when, frankly, even biologically, your brain is filled with dopamine and all its pleasure receptors and the way that we know when you first fall in love. And, you know, look, I mean, there are moments in a long-term relationship when you kind of look at your partner out of the corner of your eye and you see him in a way that you remember 30 years ago where you can get that feeling back. But it's also one of these things where the more actively you try to get it, it's like trying to remember a dream. You know, the more actively you try to think about it, the more it's going to recede from sure. you. It's not something to try to get back to. And, and it's, a, it's a whole, uh, I think, reflection of a way in this culture. We, we have this illusion that time could stop because then, of course, we'd be immortal. You know? yep. and, and, we, and we're not willing to live in the kind of normative progression of time and, and let time go forward. Um, so that's, that's one piece about the going back part. Um, the part about how do we work on it, uh, I think, leads to a kind of interesting, complex question. I mean, one of the things I feel like I've learned in the course of doing couples therapy now for 25 years is that there is this incredibly cool way that part of the chemistry of romantic attraction is that you are not only attracted to somebody who will complete you or who's the same as you or is different from you or all these things that we think of traditionally, I think we're also attracted to people who, in very interesting ways, are going to force us ultimately to deal with the parts of ourselves that we least want to deal with. It's, it's somehow part of the complementarity that leads to attraction. So that one of the things that happens over, the, over time in an intimate relationship is that these parts of us come out in the dance that we do with each other that we're very uncomfortable with. Now, you know, we tend to blame that on the other person, as in, I'm not like this with anybody else. I mean, I can't <laughs> tell you how many people. As in, and, you know, that too is a Once a week. <laughs> yeah, right. I'd say that. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, and we all say it, right? But it's, it, it too is malarkey in the sense, I don't know what word I'm allowed to use in the show, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's baloney in the sense that, yeah, it's true in the sense that we feel parts of ourselves that we don't feel with anybody else. Mm -hmm. But the underlying assumption of that statement is he, she makes me that way. And that's not true. He, she allows you to live into a part of yourself that you are not comfortable with. And, and you know, you can look at that as a problem, but I tend to look at that as an opportunity because those are also the parts of ourselves that I think we need to address, live out of, grow, change if we're going to become stronger. So that, you know, in answer to your question, I think there's a kind of totally cool built-in opportunity in intimacy where it, it brings us face-to-face -face with those parts of ourselves that we both least want to deal with which is, I think, so often why people leave each other. You know, getting back yep. to your question in the beginning, I don't think that Jason and Leslie should necessarily stay together, but I do think that they were darned unwilling to look at themselves in places that they really needed to look at themselves. And, you know, and that's the opportunity that's embedded in this whole thing. So George and I should see their nagging as a good thing because that's an effort, that's an opportunity to improve ourselves. Well, now, nagging is a very interesting thing, see, because I think one of the things that's also cool in this whole thing is that we have... We develop these wonderfully brilliant, intricate ways of kind of engaging each other in these places that were uncomfortable and yet not engaging. So nagging, for example. It's a great example. You know, when you nag somebody, I mean, nagging is this completely cool form of complaint that is, like, on the one hand, <laughs> really annoying and at the same time incredibly ineffective. So if I <laughs> nag, like, so I'll talk about myself, right? When I nag my wife, you know, and I say, I don't know, this way that I can, you know, because I'm pain in the neck, say, you know, repeatedly the same things over and over again. And I'm, you know, incredibly ineffective. And, and I, I know that what I'm doing is I'm saying something that I'm unhappy about, but nagging is a way of being unwilling to say it in a way that's really direct and honest and that actually lets me be out there and puts my own 
wishes, needs, vulnerability, and realness on the line. So it's kind of like I'm just throwing stuff out from behind a wall, you know, like, <laughs> and it's annoying, and she's got to fend it off, and, but I'm not out there. So, so what happens when you, for example, take nag, like, okay, uh, what's a good nag, you know? When are you going to put up those shutters? <laughs> right. When are you going to put up those shutters is, 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 a, is a wonderful example of a nag. Now, I'm not speaking about how you do this, but <laughs> where, I, where I would say that, I would have a way of doing it as a kind of ongoing complaint, but without saying, you know what, look, talk to me. You know, this is something I actually really need from you. It actually makes a difference to me. When you don't do that, I actually feel like I'm not getting any help or support. And, and that's a hard thing for me. So will you talk to me about this? What is the deal with the shutters? Because it is something I need. And, and that's a different conversation, even though it has the same content. And it's different for a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons it's different is because you are saying, I actually need something from you in a way that I think we're often much more wary about putting out because we're wary about the disappointment of not getting it or about what it means to really ask for it. Uh, you know, nagging is a compromise. And so that, yeah, so more direct open communication would yeah. alleviate some of that. Yeah. And it really is a method of us being able to improve some of what they what she might perceive as a fault. Yeah. But I think I think one of the things that that I guess I believe a lot of the self-help books on marriage don't get at is that you know they you know we all kind of know what to do to make a relationship better, you know, it's what you just said, direct and honest communication, being not blaming, being willing to be uh, more direct, um, you know, saying nice things to each other. I mean, it's not rocket science what is involved in making a relationship better so that one gets along better. I think what gets missed in a lot of that self-help stuff is actually the reasons why we don't do those things and why they're hard to do. You know, it's like, you know, it's sort of like, uh, it's, it's like batting practice, right? I mean, you can sit up there in batting practice and just usually uh, do pretty well. When the game starts and somebody's throwing something like 98 miles an hour under your chin and then they're throwing a slider in the outside corner, it's a hell of a lot harder. And that's like the difference between self-help and the real world. You know, it's when we're out there in the real world, we're not only having to think about how do I say this, we're contending with the reasons in ourselves that we have trouble saying it in that way. And those are real reasons from mm -hmm. within ourselves that make it This stuff is harder to do than it sounds. But of course it should be both equal partners. But the dirty truth of it is that in the data, especially if, 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 you're, uh, if you have children, but even, even not, the, the woman wife does the domestic stuff. And, and so I try to do, I try, I try every day, let me be a little bit better. <laughs> Doctor, let me bring up a current song I think that we all remember, Meatloaf. The protagonist in that song begins by promising his girlfriend he's going to love her to the end of time. By the end of the song, he's praying for his time to be over. In fact, he wants off of the planet Earth it's that bad. So my question is this, why does early love and passion sometimes lead to that type of disappointment? We have some ideas about that that I think are right and wrong at the same time. You know, I think that there is a, you know, part of this current idea we have about marriage is that you get married, it's exciting in the beginning, you have all of this love and passion, and I mean, the song is an incredibly cynical, ironic song about how basically Meatloaf's got to have sex with her, or got to promise to marry her in order to have sex with her. So that there's already this odd split of what women want and what men want that I think is, a, is oddly and wrongly caricatured, quite frankly. But then, then there's this idea that, okay, so he's trapped by her needs for domesticity, and, uh, and that trapping becomes incre you know, uh, increasingly stifling and horrendous to the point where basically he'd rather just off himself than still be married. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, a <laughs> it's a very dry, <coughs> cynical view. But, you know, I think we have this idea that even on a slightly brighter note than that song, that marriage is ultimately boring. You know, that it's a compromise that we make between our kind of promiscuous biological selves and our need to be civilized. Uh, and it's a necessary compromise, but it's not all that wonderful and exciting a compromise. And a lot of the ideas we have about that are we think we get used to each other. Right? I mean, that's sort of the fundamental, I think, premise, that we get used to each other sexually, we get used to each other emotionally, we get to know each other so well that there's not a whole lot left to know, there's no newness left, so naturally we get bored with each other. Now. I think it's not wrong that people get bored, obviously. I mean, that's a kind of observable phenomenon, and it's, again, part of what sparks all of these bring back your passion books. 
I think the premise that we get bored because we get to know each other so well and we get used to each other is actually dead wrong. That, that actually what I think happens more often than not is that people get scared. Um, you know, if you think about it, how do we ever get to know each other fully? I mean, we're like relentlessly uh, complex beings. We're always changing. I mean, the idea that you, uh, for example, the idea that your partner knows you fully is an insult to you. You know, you're a more complicated person than that, you know? And, um, I, but I think what happens over time is that these more vulnerable, complicated, dangerous parts of ourselves, really, a as we get to know somebody better, we start to get known in those places. And we need to hide. So we develop all these really interesting ritual dances and arrangements that I think are, are designed to keep us at a certain distance from one another. That distance then in turn leads to the boredom. And, uh, and the boredom leads to all these things that you know, spark the self-help books and the song. First of all, you're your husband's friend uh, and partner and so forth. And I believe that there always needs to be communication between the two of you. Um, you always need to support each other, be there for each other. Um, and just trust each other and... So even with the person that knows us in all likelihood the best, yeah. we still create these little barriers totally. to, to keep ourselves to ourselves. Like, I bet you, Nickel, that if you think about your marriage, right, how many times do you, well, maybe this isn't true for you, no. but, but uh, how many times do you feel that your wife thinks she understands you when in fact she doesn't quite? You know, how many times do I sit in my office with, some, with two people and they'll say, okay, well, I know Joe feels X. And Joe will raise his hand and go, well, actually, I don't feel X at all. I feel Y. And we, make, we start making these assumptions about how we know each other and who each other are that are usually not totally wrong. They're kind of half right and half wrong. But they're facilitative. I mean, they're designed to keep a certain arrangement that mm -hmm. we agree to together that is ultimately, it's safe, but it's stagnant. And, and those are the things, you know, when I'm talking about marriage being ultimately a potentially risky proposition that has great rewards next to it, uh, that's what I'm talking about. Are we willing to undo some of those more stagnant arrangements that keep us safe? And to um, you know, one of the uh, one of the propositions that I have is celebrate each other's differences. And by that, I'm not I'm not talking about Mars and Venus and these kind of caricatured ideas of what men and women are that I think permeate our culture. I'm talking about are we really willing to be surprised by each other? You know, are we willing to try to relate to each other as if we don't know each other? Uh, and uh, uh, and find the newness in that. Uh, she has an incredible sense of humor. Uh, she uh, can read me like a book, um, and uh, she can play me like a fiddle. <laughs> um, so uh, it, it, it makes it very uh, interesting. Every day it, it seems to be a new, a new challenge. A and new uh, adventure. A new adventure. But I was going to ask you about the, the resolutions that you have within the book, the yeah. eight resolutions on how to gain, I w uh, as I will see it, uh, to gain the maximum out of yeah. the marriage benefit. And a couple that you have there um, that were particularly <laughs> interesting was one of them is have real sex, mm. and the other is give up your addictions. Yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit about those yeah. two? Sure. E in a way, each one of these is about the same thing. You know, mm -hmm. e each of the eight resolutions is an effort to break people out of a kind of defensive solipsism that I think causes us to feel stagnant over time and to meet each other in a new, in a new way. But um, have real sex, for example. Uh, here's one that I think is, is uh, where a marriage can be an incredible antidote to some of what is really uh, insidious and malignant in our culture today. I mean, I, one of the things I'm actually interested in apart from this book is the whole notion of what's happening to sexuality in our culture and what's happening to kids mm -hmm. sexually and to what a culture of both explicit and implicit pornography and explicit sexuality that not only is um, problematic because it's so explicit, but also is problematic because the quality of sexuality that it's conveying is so disconnected and non-emotional. Mm -hmm. What's that doing to us? Not just to kids, but to all of us. Because I think it's creating an image of sexuality that is increasingly uh, distant and non-emotional. So we all grow up, I think, and live in this culture where we have these images of sexuality that are pornified, you know, that where it's about action figures that are all airbrushed doing these incredible things gymnastically for you know, multiple hours a day. And we've, we've come to believe that this is a kind of normative view of sexuality and then that in turn, whatever we have, which is inevitably going to be more human, is disappointing. And one of the things I'm arguing in the book about sex is that, that it can be a way between two people who are really willing to be radical about those images and to push them away and to see them for what they are, of finding something that's more real and enlivening. 
you know, one of the things, as an aside, I think that's happening to kids these days is that sex is such an important thing developmentally. You know, it's not just s important in and of itself. It is an important way that we negotiate different life stages. Mm -hmm. You know, so that if you think about a teenager, the whole negotiation of desire in the face of somebody else's willingness to say yes or no is a really critical negotiation in terms of growing up and respecting somebody else's separate being. When you get older and being able to continue to have a sexual relationship even as your body changes and you're increasingly far from these images of what people are supposed to look like that are around us is a way to stay alive and uh, in a culture that you know tells us we're over the hill. All of these things are really important. We're losing the ability to have them in the face of the images that we have in this culture. I think marriage can be an antidote to that if it's done right. And give up your addictions? So, yeah. So like we're all rats, right? In a certain, yeah. I mean, we're really elegant rats and we're incredibly thoughtful and we're much more complicated and we have emotions and all these things that differ us from rats. But in a certain way, we're like rats in that if you give us a pellet, we'll do the same thing again that got that pellet. So, you know, and if you think about life, uh, as time goes on, you develop more and more ways in life that just to get these little, you know, we have our coffees, we have our television, we have our, our things that have given us short-term pleasures and gratifications. Um, and our lives, if we don't watch it, just simply become increasingly made of the fabric of all of these small habits and mm -hmm. addictions. Some of them are large, like drugs and alcohol. Some of them are small, like just sitting in front of the television at night or, you know. Uh, but what happens is each one of those things um, takes out of the picture an opportunity for doing something new or for doing something different. And so uh, when I'm talking about giving up habits and addictions, I'm talking about taking the risk of wiping some of the slate clean of how we live our lives day to day in a relatively safe place and making room for something new. Um, you see it all the time in relationships, and we were talking about nagging right earlier. Nagging is a kind of habit. You know, there are ways that people can get into these back and forth, slightly irritated, you know, there was actually, I was watching The Office the other night, uh, there was a rerun of The Office, and they did this incredibly hilarious thing where they showed a couple, uh, Michael and Jan, who were having this caricature of a nagging argument, but The Office was brilliant because it, it just took it to the 28th degree and made it like utterly embarrassing, and we could see, you know, how much hostility we kind mm -hmm. of encode in these sort of habitual ways of being together. But but those n those habits are ways of just holding something in a place where it can't change. It just uh, just leaves it there. It's comfortable. It never changes. It just moves forward in time, and we get stuck in it. I think you need um, a person that you can share your life with. I think that person has to challenge you. Um, you can't fall into a rut. From, the, our, from my standpoint, because it's yes. <laughs> it's always about us. <laughs> yes. um, our relationship has changed. The children are now out right. of the house. Don't be afraid to, to not do the things that we haven't been able to do for the last 25 years yeah. while they've been around. Right. Just go for it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, these things always require a negotiation, but, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, it's a wonderful moment in time. I mean, I, my kids, I have one left now, two have left, and, you know, there is a way that when folks are returned to themselves, mm -hmm. it's an incredibly complicated moment. I, yep. mean, it, I, I don't know whether it's like this for you, but you know, it can feel a little bit like a first date. Like you're sitting there looking at each other, like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, except we're in the same bed tonight. I mean, how are we going to negotiate this? And you know, I think it's it's one of those moments where people feel a lot of inclination to invoke the usual suspects that make them feel comfortable together, mm -hmm. rather than okay, can you stand it? I mean, can you stand to sit in this moment of discomfort with each other, where you actually, you know, are finding each other again and 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 deal with that uneasiness. Mm -hmm. you know? For me, when I read your book, mm. I thought the best meaning I could take mm. away from the book was the, the benefits to a person to be able to be a time traveler, yeah. to in fact be able to stay with that same person and have all of that history. And why throw that away, right. or at least think hard before you're, you're right. ever willing to do that. Yeah, yeah you know, it's, it's really interesting. We, we uh, I think, I think that there is a way in which sort of we've, we've somewhat lost track of the incredible importance of continuity in this culture. You know, I mean, everything comes at us so mm -hmm. fast. Everything is always so new. You know, narrative, I mean, actually, it's, it's something you see in our political debate right now where the whole notion of a politician's record, I mean, like having to be continuous with your own record is, is being renegotiated. You know, you can just say something and it's now a thing instead of having to tie it to what it was. And 
it, it, it's not easy to be continuous, you know, because when you're talking about what's so wonderful about being able to live continuously, you also have to live with the pain of the past as well. So I think there are dynamic reasons why we sometimes try to sever our narratives in time. But we lose so much when we do that. Uh, we lose our sense of, of being a continuous self, of, of our memories, of our, of our sense of what matters together. Yeah. Of course, for, for me personally, um, the greatest benefit and joy is being able to have a family together. Um, the family, the children, is the continuation of um, the relationship between me and Leo. Um, and I feel that as a, you are not a family until you actually have children. That to me is, then you're complete. What yeah. else should we do in order to reap the most out of our long-term relationship? Yeah. You know, I've thought in the course of talking about the book about what, what would be um, the single thing or a single couple of things that folks can do, you know, that are really actionable, that you can kind of hold in your head as mm -hmm. a yellow post-it that, um, that you can just use. And, and I, I have two things. I mean, one is, you know how, like, if you're sitting on an airplane and you're feeling conversational with the person next to you, you have a talk with them where you're really interested in them. You know, it's like everything's new and, uh, you know, you, you wonder who they are. Uh, if you're open to that, uh, how often do we do that in our marriages? You know, mm -hmm. how, how often do we do we bring that kind of newness and surprise and openness to the person who's across from us? Um, so that's one. The other is this whole thing about how to think about repeating problems. I mean, again, I don't think that there's a relationship in the face of this earth that isn't characterized by, and even in some ways, comfortably held together by repeating problems. You know, it's part of the fabric of how we create a sense of continuity with each other. But what if we start thinking about those as windows, you know, windows into ourselves, you know, that, that they encode parts of ourselves that we could take a look at. So reframe it, not as necessarily just problems, but uh, no matter how hard they are, okay, there's something here I can learn from. Um, I think that's an incredibly powerful thing that folks can do in terms of thinking about how to go forward. You also talk in the book about the role of forgiveness and about humility. Yeah. Yeah. as being important ingredients to a successful marriage. Right. I tried to pay attention to those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> those Forgiveness yeah. especially. <laughs> yeah, they're hard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're hard. I mean, I think, you know, in a way, each one of these eight resolutions that I throw in the book, they, they're meant to uh, encode something that's a little deeper. And, uh, and forgiveness is a great example. You know, look, I mean, on the surface of it, just being able to be forgiving in a kind of daily way is, uh, is an important, useful thing to help folks get along. But if you think about um, what, what the nature of blame is, it, it takes you to a slightly deeper place, too. I mean, what's blame? I mean, blame is the idea that, more often than not, that something should be different than it is, mm -hmm. and, that, and that it's somebody's fault that it's not. And, and how much is, th is that attitude a product of this world we live in, too? You know, a kind of non-acceptance of what is, and replacing that with a sense that we have an entitlement or a right to have things different. So if you think about what it means to make a kind of commitment to forgiveness, it's also, it's not just a commitment to kindness, it's also a commitment to having a more realistic sense of what is, and living, and living in that place rather than this more illusory sense of entitlement that things should be other than what they are. I mean, no one promised us perfect lives, no one promised us lives that aren't without pain and hardship and difficulty. If we had that, we'd never grow and life wouldn't be very interesting anyway. Now, there are moments when I wanted to be married to everybody else <laughs> but, and I know that my husband feels exactly the same way. But in the long run, there is something about having the shared experiences and the shared history and that uh, cannot be substituted. It's a, a very unique, um, a very unique feeling. Just in the book that us baby boomers are growing older, but you're worried that we're going to die without even having grown up, yeah. so to speak. So. Yeah, it's, it's a line. <laughs> <laughs> risking, do, do we risking. have to grow up? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, we do. I mean, well, well, we may not. I mean, we, we, uh, we should grow up. Whether, whether we will or not remains to be seen, I think. I think, um, but I think it's, uh, I love what you said because there's a, I think embedded in what you said is one of the reasons that we're so scared of growing up. You know, I think we think of time, once again, as this kind of linear lockstep progression that leads us inexorably towards something that's ultimately narrowing 
and death, right? Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and we don't realize the degree to which, in certain ways, once we accept the fact that time goes forward, there's also more room to go back and forward a little bit. I mean, look, that's what you're talking about when you're talking about continuity, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, continuity is a way of holding memory together. Right. You know, so that, you know, I'm really aware now, for example, my daughter going off to college, you know, I, I'm filled with memories of her as a little girl, mm -hmm. you know, oh, and, yeah. and, and, and they're wonderful memories to have. I mean, they're tinged with sadness because I miss her, but I, they're also a part of me that, that you can't even check back in on if you're not willing to feel the sadness that accompanies them, you know. So that, yeah, we need to grow up. It's for sure true. And we need to accept life as it is. We need to accept living in time and the limitations of getting older and all of that stuff. But it doesn't mean that we can't have the pleasures of feeling young every now and then or also going back. It's just not a linear progression. I don't know. Something innately in me says, although we have to grow older, we should fight it every step of the way. Right. <laughs> hey, but listen, there's a difference between, see, accepting it as a fundamental truth that we have to live with and yet being allowed to fight it versus having the illusion that it doesn't have to happen, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm mm -hmm. totally with you on fighting it. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm with you on living life as kind of dynamically and in, in, in tolerance of as much conflict as possible. I mean, I think that's fullness. That is different from the entitled view, like for example, that's embedded in a cosmetic surgery culture, right? That we shouldn't have to grow up. It's a, uh, you know, look, once you're fighting it, you're already accepting the reality of it. That's all I'm arguing for. Uh, my generation, um, the baby boomer generation, the women in my generation were really the trailbla trailblazers and we fought very long and very hard to make sure that the generations of women who followed us would be uh, treated equally, would have equal opportunity to get a job, to get a job at the same pay, um, to get paid for what they were worth, uh, not to be uh, looked at as uh, in, a, in a lesser or lower light because they had chosen to have a career. Uh, Let's talk about criticism but by way of an example. Yeah. You talk in one of the chapters about this couple yeah. in which they've been married a long time. She has two kids. She's 10 pounds heavier. Yeah. They're out <coughs> to dinner. She's about to bite into the strawberry shortcake and he right. says, you sure you really want to eat that? Talk with us about the role of criticism in a relationship. Yeah. Do, what, does one couple think they're helping the other? Does the other resent it? Is that harmful? Is it, is it helpful? Yeah. Yeah, so, all right, let's add a third thing to those two things that are really important. So look, look at yourself first before you look to what's wrong with the other. And, uh, and boy, that'll go a long way in making life better with somebody else. Here, here's, here's how that fits into that example. I, as I recall, in that example, um, the guy... The guy was a guy whose mother had been problematically obese, and, and she had kind of let her life go into this sort of sea of passivity and self-indulgence in a way that had taken her away from uh, being a mother and being a wife. And I mean, she, he'd really seen her life go downhill because she wasn't able to contend with her own kind of hunger and passivity. So every time he would see his wife gain a few pounds, that image of his mother would come up in his head. So where's that criticism coming from in him in that moment? You know, is it coming mm -hmm. from a kind of legitimate concern for his wife? Or is it coming from a place of anxiety that's just his own, about his own history, his own scripts that he's imposing on her? And I think that there is a place in marriages and a place in relationships for trying to find a way to say whatever it is you feel, whatever it is you want. But you've got to discriminate between what is legitimate caring for another person what is, as politically problematic as it might be, a kind of legitimate wish that your spouse lose a few pounds, because that's part of life too, versus what is a kind of being out of touch with your own anxieties and then acting that out in your criticisms because there's really an anxiety in your own self that you can't contend with. And that, I think, was what I was trying to get at in that anecdote. I just wonder, is there really a good way to criticize the other person without them taking it yeah. the wrong way? Well, I think you got to define good. I mean, is there a way to criticize another person where they're not going to feel defensive and irritated and, you know, yeah, usually not, right? Yeah. But is, uh, you know, is defensiveness and irritation and all that stuff necessarily a bad thing? And, and I would argue not, not really. I mean, it's, it can be part of the dynamic of, of a relationship. And look, if you say, you know, this may sound a little dicey and you'd have to really work on something to get here, but if you say, you know what, I want to talk about this. I, I totally understand you have a right to eat whatever you want to eat. And uh, 
But at the same time, I love the way you look when you're a little thinner. Call me a pig, but I do. And, and also, when you do that, it, I, it, it takes me back to this place where I feel like I'm, in, I'm with some woman who's going to just completely lose herself to this kind of other power. And I know that's not you. I really get that. But I have those feelings. I mean, that's potentially the beginning of a difficult but good conversation. No. But how many people have that <laughs> difficult but good conversation? Because that's a tough one, yeah, right? But more people can have it than think they do. That's, yeah. that's what I'm arguing. See, see, one of the things yeah. I'm really pushing at in this book is, look, I don't think, despite the title, that everybody should stay married. I don't think that marriage is necessarily, in and of itself, a good thing. In fact, the research that everybody quotes as saying marriage is good for you, we were talking about this before we started, actually, it's good for men. If you really look at the stats and you break them down, Women who are married tend to be less happy than women who are unmarried, while men who are married tend to be more happy than men who are unmarried. It's asymmetrical in its benefit. Mm. So I think even the argument that marriage itself is a good thing is deeply problematic. I think it can be a good thing, but it means really being willing to take some risks together and to go to places that are uncomfortable to go to. And that's, I think, what I'm trying to argue about. And I think more people can do that than think they can. Uh, and I'm only speaking because of my culture. Um, my sister and I were, you know, we were born in, in another country, and we were raised a certain way, uh, different than a lot of American kids. You know, we were raised to um, grow up, get married, have children, take care of your, your husband and your children. Um, and that's what we do, except that we also work full time. <laughs> so, you know, when our husbands come home, they have dinner on the table. Um, you know, so they, they've worked a hard day, so have we, but I, I think it benefits them. Um, it does also benefit us because, you know, we've got the beautiful kids and um, just, but I think for the most part it, it benefits them. And when we talked about marriage, I mean, it's, <coughs> uh, it's not just the traditional marriage, the heterosexual marriage we're talking about. I mean, there's certain benefits as well for uh, gay couples who can stay in long-term relationships and even have the benefit of marriage. Yeah, I believe that a lot. I, I, uh, we were talking before we began about there's some really interesting studies out there that are starting to show that gay people who are married are happier in their marriages than straight people. And uh, I, I, I have the idea that some part of that is that marriage has more meaning at this moment in this culture for gay people than straight people. There's a real reason to do it that has a kind of larger political purpose uh, rather than I think straight marriage has become thought of as increasingly this conventional boring choice. And similarly, I also think that people can reap all the benefits that I'm talking about by virtue of, of, of really substantial commitments to work things out, whether they call it legally a marriage or not. I mean, really what we're talking about here is commitment mm -hmm. and a willingness to really stay through hard things and really wrestle with yourself and, uh, uh, and do that with somebody else. Uh, I had a rough year, my last, um, my last child, my last delivery, you know, issues with the pregnancy, and he was there. He was there every time, every doctor's appointment, everything that was going on. So he was there for that, and, and I think that's realistically what he thinks a husband is, is there when you really, really need him. The Not rest of the, the time. everyday stuff. Yeah. The rest of the time, you can take that's care right. of. That's <laughs> everyday stuff is all on you. And the value, ultimately, of long-term commitment is we become better people in the process, hopefully. That's, that's what I believe, yeah. You know, there's, it's interesting. We think of... Um, in this culture, whenever we think of expanding our lives, I think we reflexively think of looking outside of the lives that we already have. Mm -hmm. We don't think about the degree to which there is all of this untapped potential in the lives that we already have. You know, we don't have to necessarily add a new thing to it to get more out of it. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's part of how we, we think about things these days. So I would hope that there would be, whether one calls it marriage or whatever, that there would be a commitment between two people um, to stay together and, it ha and, and have it a legal commitment because if it's not a legal commitment then somebody can just get up and walk out without undergoing any going to any extreme right right getting legal <laughs> disentanglements and I mean p divorces are nasty and they're not fun and they're not quick and at least they would uh, ha having to go through all of this might make somebody want to stop think twice Mike we're about out of time any final questions for the doctor no I, I, I think other people should read the book as well I found it uh, very helpful very informative the stories were interesting and I'm looking forward to working on our relationship over the next, <laughs> <laughs> the next period of time because there's a lot of a lot of great yeah. stuff in there yeah. I thought it found it helpful yeah thanks thanks to both of you for having me I've enjoyed doctor, the conversation it's a wonderful a book final mm. comments for the audience you know 
life, uh, yeah, <laughs> this is going to sound incredibly trite. Life is not easy, you know. But I think that there are wonderful benefits to be found in the hardships of life. Uh, somebody said it to me beautifully once. He said, you know, when I first came to see you, I felt, um, I felt, I felt disappointed in my life. And then I started to feel like, well, all right, my life is disappointing, but you know what? It's okay. And then I started to realize that, God, so much of what I have, I've gotten from struggling with the things that are disappointing to me. And that, I thought, was a wonderful thing to say. I think there's a lot of truth in it. Are more people not disappointed than disappointed? Because I don't feel disappointed at all, yeah. whether my, professionally or personally. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the generalizations are hard. I would say that, you know, look, if all the research on happiness suggests that there's not necessarily a kind of absolute value to happiness, that, that people know whether they're happy or not based on how they see themselves relative to other people. Uh, same with wealth, same with all kinds of things, right? So the more we live in a culture that tells us that a normative level of happiness and satisfaction is increasingly a raised bar, mm -hmm. the, less, the more disappointed people are going to get because we compare ourselves to what we think should be. And I think we live in a culture that's doing that to us, that's, that's increasingly generating an unrealistic sense of what life can be. And I think that makes people in general, and I'm delighted that you're an exception, feel a uh, increasingly unhappy and disappointed. It's wonderful to be able to look at someone across the table and have a history with them. Um, I, I look at my husband and I get very emotional. I look across the table. Um, it's like, and I'm looking at this face that I've been looking at for 43 years. It's like looking in the mirror. <laughs> I, I know his face better than I know my own. I'm not always happy with it as he's not always happy with me. Um, it isn't 100% wonderful every minute of the day, but I couldn't imagine it any other way. Uh, taken in some, I wouldn't have done it any differently. Um, I can't imagine not being married. I, because of course, I've been married for more than half of my life, okay. so that's probably very understandable. I can't imagine not having had children, although there are times when, I, when nothing has caused me more stress in my entire life than my three children and I can't imagine life without them on the other hand so um, taken all told it's uh, thank goodness for all of them and thank goodness we did what we did get married and stick it out I thank you both and to our viewing audience until next time be well <laughs>